Much is being written and said about the feud within the Democratic organization in Texas, but judging from receptions from President and Mrs. Kennedy, the political civil war hasn't stopped Texans from giving folks a hearty welcome. Take Fort Worth this morning in drizzling rain. Thousands gathered around the presidential hotel, many starting nearly three hours before the Kennedys were to come out. Last night, more than 4,000 were at the airport at midnight to see them land. In San Antonio and Houston, Texans were friendly, warm, and enthusiastic. After all, it was Mrs. Kennedy's first trip to Texas, and Texans like to make big impressions, perhaps because of their morbid fear of things too small. For instance, no matter how big he is, every Texan says he stands tall. Some Goldwater signs and anti-Kennedy slogans have dotted the landscape. One sign in Houston read, We need another ex-president. And overhead, an airplane told a streamer saying, Coexistence is surrender. Of the five towns on this trip, only San Antonio went Kennedy in 1960. The president wants to change that in 1964, and he and the vice president and their wives are making the first of several trips to this state before next year's election. The president is speaking in Republican Dallas this afternoon, and tonight he goes before a party fundraising dinner, which the White House grinningly describes as the only political stop on this non-political tour. This is Sid Davis with the Presidential Party in Texas. Speaking in Dallas, the heartland of conservative Texas Republicanism, President Kennedy this afternoon took aim at Senator Goldwater and his followers, accusing them of talking plain nonsense to the nation. The president did not mention Goldwater by name, but it was clear from his words that he was offering spirited debate to the principles advanced by the senator at one time or another. The president's audience included businessmen, scholars from the Graduate Research Center here, and civic leaders. Mr. Kennedy was not unaware that a month ago, U.N. Ambassador Stevenson spoke here and later received a somewhat hostile, if not dangerous, reception from right-wing demonstrators. Looking out over his audience, Mr. Kennedy said, there will always be dissident voices heard in the land expressing opposition without alternatives, finding fault but never favor, perceiving gloom on every side and seeking influence without responsibility. Borrowing a phrase, Mr. Kennedy said, we cannot expect that everyone will talk sense to the American people, but he said we can hope fewer people will listen to nonsense. Then the president went on to explain the complexities of life and survival in the 60s. And despite it all, he said, under his administration, this country is second to none militarily and economically. He told of our superior weapons and stockpiles, our 70 million employed, and listed other achievements of his 1,000 days in office. With a stunningly dressed Mrs. Kennedy at his side, the president has been warmly greeted in Texas, where the exposure is designed not to hurt his vote-getting chances next year. This is Sid Davis in Dallas. A good ten seconds and try to give me, a, you know, a, as calm as you can, whatever you know. Right. Okay? Right. This is Sid Davis, and I'm at the Dallas Trademark, where President Kennedy was to make a major address this afternoon. The word is now being passed throughout the House that President Kennedy has been shot and has been taken to the Parkland Hospital near here. The only information we have at the present time is that the President was fired upon as his car approached a cloverleaf to go onto a freeway to come to the Dallas trademark for his speech. According to reporters who were closer to the president, Mrs. Kennedy is supposed to have said, my God. The reporters did notice that the president's body did fall limp. Governor John Connolly of Texas and the president are in the hospital. Their conditions at this moment are unknown. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas, from the, this is Sid Dallas. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas trademark in Dallas, Texas. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas Trademark, a gigantic and beautiful building for public exhibitions 
where the word is just now being passed to several hundred persons sitting at their noon luncheon table that President Kennedy has been shot. We have no information on the president's condition. We do know that he has been taken, along with Governor John Connolly of Texas, to the hospital nearby. The president arrived in Dallas a short while before the incident took place. There were large and happy crowds on the streets. It was a clear day, the sun shining, not a cloud in the sky. There were several hundreds of thousands of persons that lined the streets from the airport to where the incident took place. Crowds were very thick during the noon hour downtown. The shooting took place at about 12.30 as the president's open convertible with Mrs. Kennedy sitting next to him approached a cloverleaf going onto a freeway that would eventually take him to the trademark. We noticed, riding behind the president, that suddenly the president's car sped ahead with a tremendous burst of speed. Then Secret Service men began to run. By then the car was out of sight. We could not see it. But local policemen started running over a hill toward the cloverleaf and up onto a railroad track trestle that crosses over that superhighway. We have arrived at the trademark now. We are awaiting word from the hospital on the president's condition. At the moment, we have no additional information. This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas trademark in Dallas, Texas. Hello. Sid, stand by a second. What do you hear? Sid? Just a minute. Jim Snyder here. I'm going to ask Sid Davis some questions in Dallas, Texas. Okay, Jim, turn your uh, monitor down just a little bit more. You'll still be able to hear Sid. Okay, Charlie, I turned it down. Say something. Okay, I'm talking to you. Okay. Okay. Sid? Yes? Okay, you and Jim are set to go for recording for a two-way. All right. Now, let me I... hit the whole button on my phone, and you're on, the, on your way. All right. Sid, can you give us as complete a description as you can of the events leading up to the attempt on the president's life. Uh, yeah. Let's try, um, let's try. Hello, Sid. Hello, Sid. Sid. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jim's apparently not talking to you on the phone also. Jim, he's on the beat line. I can't feed into the beat line. I don't hear okay. anything, Charlie. Uh, all right, Charlie. I goofed. I didn't pick up the phone. I'm sorry. All right, Sid, I'm going to start right now. All right, go. Sid, can you give us as completely as possible a rundown on the events that led up to the attempt on the president's life? Well, Jim, we're coming in from Love Field in Dallas. There was a very warm reception out there, about three or 4,000 people, mostly young people, uh, cheering and very enthusiastic over the president and Mrs. Kennedy's arrival. And Mrs. Kennedy and the president walked over to shake hands uh, with uh, these people in the crowd. Most of them were young people. Then the motorcade proceeded into Dallas. For a, it's about a 12-mile ride into Dallas, and it took about 30 minutes. And as we got closer into town, the crowd uh, became very large and uh, very warm and friendly. They were not wildly cheering, but they were enthusiastic. And there were very few, if any, heckling type of signs. Uh, most of the signs welcomed the president. We got through town, and as we were leaving the end of the downtown section, heading toward an approach onto a freeway, this is sort of a cloverleaf, we were on the press bus, uh, I would say about 10 cars behind the president. We noticed a sudden burst of speed on the president's car. Uh, the car just shot forward, and uh, local policemen who had been standing guard along the route then started to run. And one reporter uh, uh, said that he heard three shots being fired, but we were not sure that they might have been a car backfiring. But suddenly we noticed local police running to the top of this cloverleaf where a railroad trestle appears to pass. The president's car was going under this overpass at the time. What kind of a car was the president riding? He was riding in an, his open uh, midnight blue Lincoln Continental convertible. Mrs. Kennedy was with him along with Governor Connolly and Mrs. Connolly. That's the bubble top That's car. Right. This is the bubble top that carries a plexiglass top. Jim, I'm standing in the trademark where the president was supposed to speak, and announcements are now being made of the people. Uh, a hush went through this crowd here when they first learned the president had been shot, and I just noticed a man walking by me with his wife. His wife was limp, hearing the news that the president had been shot. He was escorting her out of the building. She was very pale. Just a, just a, a man and woman who live here in Dallas. The announcement is now being made to the people from the podium, and I'm trying to pick that up. Stand by. 
the music has stopped. They were playing an organ uh, during a, this luncheon program. The president was to deliver a luncheon speech before a group of businessmen, some people who study here at the Advanced Research Institute, and some civic leaders. But now that the, now that the announcement has been made, the music has stopped here in the hall. No one is saying a word. People are starting to filter out very quietly. Some are coming over here near the telephones to find out if anyone has any word on the condition of the president and Governor Connolly as well as their wives. Sid, have you been able to talk to anyone who was uh, fairly close to the uh, scene and what well, happened? We, the we, were, we were, I would say, in the press bus, uh, about ten cars behind, and then they have your pool reporters, those reporters who are able to ride a little forward of us, who reported hearing three shots, and uh, they have practically confirmed now that there were three shots being fired as if uh, they came from a, an automatic type of weapon. Did the president collapse in the car or what? Well, as we understand it, the president fell forward, and so did Governor Connolly, and we were also told that uh, bullet uh, marks or wounds were visible on the white shirt of Governor Connolly on his chest. Uh, this is what we've been told so far. Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Connolly are, are at the hospital. It's about five minutes uh, from the trademark. Were, they, were Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Uh, Connolly in the same car with the president yes, and the were. governor? I, yes, I mentioned that, and, and they did not appear to be hit, although we, we are not at this moment sure of anything because uh, uh, almost a complete chaos has now taken place. The White House staff people are trying to arrange uh, uh, press tables, telephones, etc., to get the story out, and uh, the emergency room here, as you know, is, being, is very busy. Is there any... What is the latest word you have heard on the President's condition? We have, we have only the word that the President has been shot. This is all uh, the information we have at the present time. The President's car, after this incident took place, just shot forward in a tremendous burst and headed right for the hospital. It passed the trademark completely by, and this is the, this is the first indication we got uh, that something serious, actually serious, had happened. When the shooting took place, Sid, was the President's car just cruising along where the Secret Service men oh, running along beside yes. it as they usually do? That's right, the Secret Service, uh, there was a Secret Service car, we call that the Queen Mary, it follows the President's car immediately behind. It's a great big large Cadillac uh, convertible about 10 or 12 years old, and Secret Service men ride its running boards, it has running boards, there are Secret Service men on, alongside the running boards and inside the car. And uh, these men, of course, are helpless when you have a sniper-type uh, situation, as we did have today. Uh, in that uh, Secret Service car, they carry a Tommy gun that is a rapid-fire repeating type of weapon. And I've seen it many times being placed in the car when we get off the President's plane. It's, uh, it's carried in a black bag, but apparently this time they never got a chance to use the automatic weapon. It uh, is usually on the floor in the rear seat of the uh, Queen Mary as the Secret Service follow the President. Okay, Sid, well, you're on your way to the hospital now, right? I'm on the way to the hospital now, Jim. We'll try to keep you posted. Thank you very much. Okay, Sid. Everyone in Washington, like Americans everywhere, is stunned by the news of the assassination attempt on President Kennedy this afternoon in Dallas. When the news came, the House was adjourned, but the Senate was in session debating a bill. Majority Leader Mike Mansfield was called to a Senate cloakroom telephone and told the news. Mansfield paused and said, this is terrible, I can't find words. Senate Minority Leader Dirksen was then called to the phone, and when he, he heard the news, he said, oh God, this is the most distressing thing that could ever happen. I am shocked. On a motion by Mansfield, the Senate recessed at 1.55 p.m. to wait for further developments in the presidential shooting. Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon told the Senate just before it recessed, after hearing the tragic news, that if ever there was an hour to pray, this is the hour all Americans should. During the quorum call, Mansfield and Dirksen went to the Senate Democratic cloakroom, apparently to call the White House. Senators who had watched the news tickers off the Senate chamber drifted onto the floor and huddled in groups talking. When Mansfield and Dirksen returned, Morris withdrew his quorum call request and said, if ever there is an hour when all of us should pray, this is the hour. Mansfield then made two routine moves dealing with the legislative program for today and next week and recessed the Senate pending developments. Jim Snyder, Washington. The Vice President has gone into seclusion. There is no information as yet as to whether he has taken the oath or on arrangement for the presidential vote for Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who was also not wounded. Here at the hospital, groups of people stand by outside, young girls who 
two hours ago were cheering wildly the arrival of the young president and his stunning wife are now wiping tears from their eyes. People are walking through the hospital corridors here in disbelief. It's hard to believe to hear the word, oh dear, spoken so many times. A few minutes ago, Father Oscar Huber, the pastor of the Holy Trinity Catholic Church, in which this hospital, in which whose parish this hospital is located, administered to the president the last rite. There are several clergymen, Catholic clergymen, in the building. The president did receive the last rites of the church. We do not know whether the last rites came prior to his death. I'm now going to check for just a moment. Would you please stand by? I'm going to check for just a moment to see if there's any additional information. Uh, there is nothing on. Yeah, there was nothing. There is nothing additional on the vice president both taking or Mr. Kennedy's departure. We do not have information here at the hospital because of the chaotic situation and the shock of this whole tragic incident on whether the assassin has been apprehended. We, we understand that the shock that took the president's life came from a building downtown known as the State Book Depository Building and the Secret Service men were seen gathered around there. I talked to a young man, Charles Hodge, 17 years old, who was a senior in high school here in Dallas, and he was taking pictures of the motorcade as it rounded the, the cloverleaf to head onto the freeway where the incident took place. And he said that he saw Mrs. Kennedy lean over the president and saw Governor Connolly slump in the seat of their open Lincoln Continental convertible. This whole incident has been very tragic. Ironically, it comes at a time when uh, the president was about to address a group of civic fathers here in Dallas. The incident also follows a rather embarrassing situation of a month ago when UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson was not only struck with a placard by a demonstrator, but was also sat upon. The Secret Service is handling the apprehension of the assassin. We have no additional information at this time, Jim, but I would be glad to answer any questions you have. Sid, have you been able to talk to any of the Secret Service men? No, Secret Service men are not saying anything at the moment. They're the police uh, affair, uh, the, the police part of this incident is handled several miles from here at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Kennedy at last reports in the hospital. He was seen walking down one of the the corridor uh, being escorted by another woman that might have been Mr. Connell. Is Vice President, or rather I should say now, President Lyndon Johnson in the hospital? No, Lyndon Johnson has left the hospital. Lyndon Johnson has gone into seclusion. The Secret Service will not divulge whereabouts, or will uh, the White House at this time and not go to uh, And that is the situation at this moment. Now, in the motorcade, Sid, when the shooting took place, Mr. Johnson was in the car behind President Kennedy, as we understand That's right. He was in the car behind the President. And uh, was not, uh, could not have been hit could be, uh, if there was not a spray. Uh, Senator Ralph Yarbrough, who was also two cars behind the President, uh, told me when I asked him what he saw, he said, it's too horrible to describe. They were seriously hurt. This is, of course, before we have been informed of the President. Dead. Well, now, the president was shot when, about 12.30 Dallas time? That's right. That would have been 1.30 your time. The shooting incident took place at about 12.30 Dallas time during the noon hour after coming through the downtown section. It was a brilliant sunny day, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people turned out. And we were taking notes on the bus about the, the crowd and the welcome signs, some of the signs in politics that were not so welcome, but it was a cheerful crowd, an enthusiastic crowd, and they were happy to see the president, Mrs. Kennedy, she was dressed in a sort of a raspberry-colored uh, two-piece suit, as I recall, and uh, her traditional pillbox hat, and the president had on his blue pinstripe, which he is so fond of and wears many times in Washington, and uh, he, he was seen to slump over the seat, Mrs. Kennedy then tried to grasp him and grab him, and we were told, uh, from perhaps a secret service man, second-hand, that he said, oh my, 
my God, he's been shot. But we don't have that official. No one has yet can verify those words. It's too early. You know, well, part of this tragedy is that the Kennedy visit to Texas was going very well. It was it had been a happy affair. The president uh, spoke this morning outside the hotel in Fort Worth and was in good humor. Absolutely, Jim. Uh, he was in tremendous spirits this morning and all through the trip, and both he and Jackie seemed to be enjoying themselves. I rode with the president last night. I was on the president's plane last night uh, coming into Fort Worth, and it was about midnight, and he seemed to be in very good spirits. It's been a tremendously trying day for him. Uh, he came into the cabin. He came into the uh, forward cabin of the plane where the reporters sit. And he smiled and walked back into his cabin. And Mr. Kennedy did the same. It's just they just came in briefly and then they retired to the presidential suite, which is in the rear of the Air Force One, which is the president's plane. But they were in tremendous spirits last night. And then this morning, the president was up early to talk to a group of people outside the <coughs> excuse me outside the hotel uh, in the. Uh, parking lot and uh, Fort Worth uh, was very warm to him and he was happy it was only an 8 minute flight from Fort Worth to Dallas and it was only a 45 minutes or so after we had gotten into Dallas that this took place the commotion you hear in the background if at all you can hear it uh, are additional telephones now being brought in for emergency press rooms that are being set up the telephones in the hospital are at a premium and uh, we're fortunate to have commandeered this one although there are many people standing in line where are you exactly in the hospital? Uh, what you might call the administrator's office, right uh, near the press room. I am uh, probably uh, 30 uh, yards or so from the emergency uh, entrance where the president's body is or was at the last time I, I had checked. Well, from the time sequence, Sid, he was shot at 12.30 Dallas time and died at 1 p.m., he really could not have lived very long once he arrived at the hospital. No, so he was mortally wounded. Uh, he lived about a half hour, and uh, the word that we had gotten at first was that, uh, that the top surgeons, neuro neurological surgeons from around the country were being alerted, but it was too late. The president was fatally injured, and uh, there was no, no chance, apparently, to save him. Uh, the hospital is only four blocks from where he was to speak, so getting to the hospital was not the problem. The president, uh, the sniper's bullet had hit a very fine mark. Uh, as I said, and I would like to repeat, uh, the very terse announcement, which will now, of course, become uh, part of history. Uh, the announcement, as read, <coughs> pardon me, as read to us, is that John F. Kennedy died at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time today in Dallas from a gunshot wound in the brain. And that was the extent of the announcement? We have no information on the assassination of the, the assassin. That was the extent of the announcement, and then the questions followed. The questions asking, where is the vice president who is now, of course, the president? When will he take his oath? Where is Mrs. Kennedy? What will she do? And the answers to those questions are that Mr. Kennedy will return to Washington. The Vice President is at a location which the Secret Service will not disclose at this time, and that Governor Connolly, who was also hit, is in satisfactory position. And that Mrs. Kennedy is, uh, I suppose, trying to do her best under these circumstances, although we have no word. It wouldn't surprise me at all if perhaps members of the family uh, might try to come out here or find their way to meet her someplace. This, uh, this whole trip uh, has been very strange. The reporters sometimes are allowed to have premonitions, and I didn't have any, so I will not say that I did. But when you are riding a press bus or when you are riding behind the president, uh, as often as we have in our bureau, I think uh, many times you think how easy it is if someone if someone really wants to kill someone, it is not a very difficult job. And uh, there are many buildings, high buildings, places where people can hide, and it is impossible to get enough policemen or enough Secret Service men to watch everybody. And uh, we have lost other presidents in our history, and John F. Kennedy is one of the one of those victims died in about 1,000 
day of his administration. He was about to speak in Dallas to a large group of people about some of the accomplishments of the new administration, some of the goals this country must reach in the next 10 or so years. The president was a man, I believe, watching him who had a great sense of history. He loved the military. He loved pumps and military band music. He would stop the motorcade as he did here today, shortly before his death, to shake a few hands, to chat with some people and say how are you, to uh, talk to them. Mrs. Kennedy seemed to be enjoying herself. Uh, it, is a, it is a shock. I, I believe that I, I think even the most hardened reporter, and I don't think there uh, are many, uh, would, would not be moved by the loss of the president of this country. To my own personal feelings, if uh, I might impose on you and uh, those people listening, are that it is a very tragic day for this country. And uh, it is uh, also very hard to talk about it. Uh, I was perhaps 10 vehicles behind the president's car with the rest of the White House press. And uh, we noticed the motion up ahead, but the president's car had gone around the bend noticed that there was a sudden surge in speed in the president's car and police began running. And then we knew something had happened. And, uh, we started to recall sound and there was the sound of perhaps one, two, or three shots. Now they, we are we told that probably were three shots indicating that a repeater weapon might have been fired. Did the thought, thought go through your mind at that time, Sid, that there might have been an assassination attempt? At the moment, not right away because the president uh, has a habit of wanting to stop his car, and so the Secret Service will always rush forward uh, to go to go to the car and uh, protect him and, and Mr. Kennedy if, if the crowd is too rowdy. At that moment, no, and then all of a sudden, I think in unison, everybody felt that something terrible had happened, and we were on a big bus and, uh, uh, with 50 or so White House reporters and trying to get the bus driver to move faster. We couldn't. The bus just wouldn't go faster. Uh, we noticed that the president's car had left the motorcade on the way to the trademark where he was supposed to be. And we pulled into the trademark minus the president's car, which was even more suspicious. Then we knew something happened. And then you can imagine 50 reporters charging through this hall, and perhaps 1,000 to 2,000 people gathered in luncheon table set and white tablecloths, silverware, dinnerware, uh, waiting for the president's arrival and an organ playing. And these reporters running like a herd through the hall saying, what happened? Uh, let's try to find out where the president's car disappeared to. And then the first words start coming back from those who might have been closer to the officials in cars closer that the president was shot, the governor was shot. And the hush went through the hall at that time. But the music played because most of the people did not know at that time that's what had happened. And people talked to each other, uh, and you could see them. And I, I noticed several women walking out limp, leaning on their husbands in the support, not, not able to believe what they had been told. It was very hard for us to believe it. We had seen this man in many motorcades uh, in Costa Rica, uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, in Bermuda, in Nassau, uh, and where crowds might have been perhaps somewhat more hostile than, than they are at home. But this was not a hostile crowd today. It was an enthusiastic one. It was friendly. Did you see any uh, very unfriendly signs in the crowd? There were, there were a couple. One said Goldwater for president. It's a traditional all over the country whenever you're coming into a presidential year. The men who are mentioned as possible contenders are all, always have supporters. Uh, someone said, I do not agree with your socialistic policies, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Dallas is, is the home of, of great Republican conservative strength. And it is not unusual for these many people here to have views op opposite the president. Uh, there are there are uh, residents of this town who perhaps are a little more vociferous, uh, a little more vehement, a little more volatile, as was uh, demonstrated when Adlai Stevenson was here uh, not many weeks ago and encountered some rather hostile people who chose to demonstrate physically rather than uh, with signs and, uh, passively. So, uh, yes, there were some signs, but there were some signs in San Antonio and some signs in Houston, and there are signs in New York. Uh, this is part of the great game of American politics. Apparently, uh, some twisted mind, uh, perhaps let some of this get go too far. Uh, so we have the tragedy we have today.
today. This is all like, you know, this is a commentary, of course, but this is the best I can, uh, the best words I can use to describe uh, what has taken place in my own personal feelings. I feel compelled almost to interpret what I think happened in downtown Dallas today, where it will live for many, many years. Sid, are there uh, members of the White House staff there at the hospital? Have we you have, seen? Uh, we have been in contact with Malcolm Kilduff. Malcolm Kilduff is uh, the Associate Press Secretary to Mr. Pierre Salinger. Mr. Salinger uh, has gone on to Tokyo from Honolulu where he met with Dean Rusk and Ambassador Lodge uh, for a trade meeting with in Japan. I'm sure Mr. Salinger will be on route to the United States uh, immediately on hearing this news. Uh, was Larry O'Brien uh, along on this trip? No, I, I have here with me, and I hope he won't give up any of his notes, but I have here standing in front of me, taking notes, a gentleman of the press uh, who, uh, who's been around the White House for many years, Chuck Roberts, is taking notes here. And uh, I don't know whether he has uh, found out anything about the vice president or about this moment. Uh, Roberts, at least we tell the vice president, and his district is going back to Washington. There's no word yet on uh, when the president's body will be returned to Washington. No, it's, it's, it's far too early. The president uh, uh, expired 55 minutes ago, Jim, and it is far too early uh, for us at this time to, to find out this information. Of course, it's very complex. Uh, the announcement to us, uh, as best I can recall, the announcement to us that the president was dead was made at uh, 1.35 Central Standard Time, 35 minutes afterward. And uh, Mr. Mr. Kilduff, who made the announcement, could barely speak the word. General Clifton, the president's military aide, was in there. Uh, he just, he's just in a state of shock. The man, I, I looked to him and I talked to him. and said, what do you hear? And he just looked at me. He had already had the news. Uh, president military aides uh, traveled with him all the time, and General Clifton was a senior aide who gave the president his daily military intelligence briefing uh, every day. Well, Sid, thank you very much for this fine report. We'll be checking back with you uh, very soon so you can continue to cover developments for us. Yes, I will, Jim. Uh, uh, I have, as I said, we will try to get them thank you as, as soon as we can. As you can understand, no hospital in the world could have been, no hospital staff in the world could have been set for such an emergency and trying to provide information. I'm sure the medical facilities here were the best available in Dallas. And there was just nothing that could have been done that was so serious at all. All right, Sid, thank you very much for your report. Right. Again, this is Jim Snyder in Washington. Here with me is Ann Corrick, a veteran correspondent on the Washington scene, who I have given the rather unhappy assignment of telling what happens when a president is assassinated or dies in office as far as the organization of government is concerned. Ann? Well, of course, the man who now assumes the great burdens of the presidency is the vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, Johnson is 55 years old. He was born uh, near Johnson City, Texas, a town founded by his grandfather, which has a, quite a heavy German population. Uh, he, Lyndon Johnson has a ranch near there called the LBJ Ranch, and ironically, President and Mrs. Kennedy had planned to spend overnight at the LBJ Ranch tonight to rest up from their Texas trip. Uh, Lyndon Johnson suffered a heart attack in 1955, but he uh, cut out smoking after that and cut down his working schedule a little bit and has been in excellent health ever since then. He, uh, he has a wife affectionately called Lady Bird Johnson and two teenage daughters, Linda Bird who is 19, and Lucy Baines, who is 16. Uh, Johnson came into politics early in his life. He uh, came to Washington as a, an aide to a congressman from Texas. And uh, in uh, 
1937, he was elected as a congressman to serve in the House in a special election. He was uh, elected to the Senate in 1948 in a very close election, which hinged on about 87 votes. Uh, Johnson is a member of the Christian Church. However, his wife and daughters are Episcopalians, and he most often attends the National Cathedral or All Saints Episcopal Churches with them here in Washington. Uh, Johnson had wanted to be president for some time. He uh, was a favorite son candidate for the Democratic nomination in 1956. It wasn't considered a serious effort on his part. But in 1960, he was serious, and he fought uh, John Kennedy very, very deeply about it. Uh, he set up headquarters early in the, in the year of 1960, campaigned very heavily and strongly and determinedly for it. And back a flood of memories about Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy in 1960. I remember the day at the Democratic Convention, before Mr. Kennedy had won the nomination, when Lyndon Johnson invited candidate Kennedy to come before the Texas delegation. And this, this was, was real tough, rough, competitive politics, where Mr. Johnson felt that he was going to at least uh, get an edge on this young man who was trying to block his presidential aspirations. And that was quite a challenge for Mr. Kennedy, and I remember distinctly his appearing before that Texas caucus and handling himself in such a way that it really backfired on Mr. Johnson and it was kind of a victory for Kennedy, and it was just the next day, I believe, that Kennedy got the nomination on the first ballot. And then the next morning, the morning after the nomination of John F. Kennedy, was that famous meeting between Kennedy and Johnson, when Kennedy asked the man he had defeated for the presidency to be his vice presidential candidate. And I guess you would agree that that set off the greatest bout of soul searching that Lyndon Johnson ever went through. He consulted with Sam Rayburn, his mentor, and now, as history will, it brings things around to a very different situation. For Lyndon Johnson, we don't know exactly where he is, but he's sitting somewhere contemplating the prospect of being sworn in as the President of the United States, succeeding the late John F. Kennedy. And who does the swearing in? Now, it has to be a member of the Supreme Court? Yes, it does, Jim. The uh, Chief Justice, if he's available. Was it possible that they would uh, apply a the Chief Justice or a Justice of the Court to Dallas because uh, there is a desire to have any gap in the succession. The country cannot be without a formal president. Yes, I believe the uh, law also makes provision in the event that a, a member of the Supreme Court is not available, that a suitable official may undertake that task of swearing in a new president. Well, the story of the assassination of John F. Kennedy continues to unfold. Uh, this has been a special report from Washington and from Dallas, Texas. Our correspondent, <coughs> Sid Davis, who was on the scene of the assassination. I will be checking back with you from time to time to keep you posted as the story unfolds. This is Jim Snyder with Ann Corey in Washington. Just moments ago, a plane left the Dallas airport carrying the body of the president and Mrs. Kennedy. We were informed by our correspondent, Sid Davis, who was in Dallas today with the president, that he is one of three reporters who have been chosen to ride on that plane back to Washington. They have already taken off by this time. The last opportunity I had to talk to Sid, he was not certain uh, on the whereabouts of Vice President Lyndon Johnson. However, there was a possibility that Mr. Johnson would be on that plane too. And because Malcolm Kilduff, the Assistant White House Press Secretary, had informed reporters that Mr. Johnson would be sworn in in a very short time, it raises the possibility that Mr. Johnson might be sworn in as the new President of the United States on that plane, making its very somber journey back to Washington. Now, we have been checking with the Supreme Court and other government agencies here in Washington on the procedure for swearing in a new president 
uh, especially when the death of the old president came so quickly. And Ann Corrick has a report on that, <clears throat> that procedure. And uh, Jim, the Supreme Court says that as of now they have no information whatsoever to give out to us on when uh, the new president will be sworn in. However, Chief Justice Warren is in the Supreme Court building and has been there all day. So the Chief Justice, as of 15 minutes ago, was still in Washington. Uh, as you recall, a history records that there was a president who was sworn in by his own father, although normally the law says that, that new presidents should be sworn in by either the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court or a, a member, another justice on the court. But Calvin Coolidge was sworn in at his home in Plymouth, Vermont, after the death of President Harding on August 3, 1923, by his father. His father was a justice of the peace. Uh, Fifteen days later, Coolidge again took the oath before a justice of the Supreme Court in Washington. If you also recall, uh, Harry Truman was sworn in at the White House by Chief Justice Harlan Stone within hours after the death of President Roosevelt on April 12, 1945. Traumatic experience that was for him, and uh, this brings to mind the a rumor story, it turned out to be a bad rumor story, out of Dallas that Vice President Johnson had suffered a heart attack on the news, on hearing the news of the assassination of Mr. Kennedy. However, that report has been completely discredited. Uh, Vice President Johnson has not suffered a heart attack, and the word we have is that in a very short time, possibly at this moment, he is being sworn in as the new President of the United States. There has been some uh, all kinds of reaction here in Washington and we have just received word of a statement by Senator U. Scott of Pennsylvania, Republican Senator of Pennsylvania and uh, Ann will give us this statement in a moment but I think Senator Scott uh, reflects the kind of thinking that everyone has to have as soon as they can get over the initial shock of hearing that a very young and vigorous man like John F. Kennedy has been cut down by an assassin. Anne, could you give us Senator Scott's statement? This is a statement from uh, Senator Scott, a Republican who has waged many political battles with the late president. He says, The whole nation shares the grief of the family of John F. Kennedy in the assassination of the president. John Kennedy served his country well and died in its service. Our hearts are heavy and our hearts are bowed. Our love and sympathy encompass his bereaved family. We have lost a leader and a friend. The Republic still stands. The assassin killed a man, not the presidency. We must all rally around the new president of the United States in this time of national crisis and pray for the health, strength, and well-being of President Lyndon B. Johnson. We must give him our understanding and help very fine statement from Senator Scott of Pennsylvania. Part of the story that has evolved here in Washington is the other members of the Kennedy family who are located here in Washington. Very ironic that the Senate was in session at the time the news was received of the death of the President. And presiding in the chair of the United States Senate was Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts, the President's brother. And Senator Wayne Morris, uh, when he heard this news, immediately interrupted the proceedings. Uh, Senator Winston Crowdy, Republican of Vermont, was making a speech on the business at hand. And uh, Senator Morris interrupted him to ask for an emergency quorum call. And uh, Senator Spessard Holland, Democrat of Florida, quickly took over the presiding officer's chair from Ted Kennedy, and Kennedy left the chamber. He rushed from the Capitol building immediately after the word of the shooting had reached him, and an aide to Senator Daniel Inouye, a Democrat of Hawaii, gave him a lift in his car to the Senate office building. The doors of uh, Senator Kennedy's office were locked, and knocks went unanswered as did phone calls. Uh, we understand that Senator Kennedy and the Attorney General Robert Kennedy, with their wives, are on their way to Hyannisport to be with their parents, the parents of the late president, 
Mr. Joseph Kennedy and Mrs. Rose Kennedy. There were <coughs> our stories all over Washington of shock at the news of the events in Dallas this afternoon. Uh, Speaker McCormick, the House of Representatives, was eating lunch in the House dining room when he was told about it. And he said, this is terrible, terrible. And later he said, all Americans of whatever religious conviction will pray for the President and Governor Conley. The reference to Governor Conley, of course, because gov the governor was shot too. However, he has survived. Is reported to be in fair condition in the same hospital in which the president died. Also, Speaker McCormick said, my God, my God, what are we coming to? Carl Albert, the majority leader in the House, the Democratic majority leader, was seen to have tears in his eyes, and he went and sat in McCormick's office with the speaker. may point out at this time, Jim, that uh, although Speaker McCormick was loyal and faithful to President Kennedy in their legislative battles, uh, reportedly they had a personal disagreement which they covered over but never completely resolved. Uh, Speaker McCormick, it, it is said, uh, became a little irritated with the late President Kennedy when Mr. Kennedy first went to the House of Representatives as a young congressman and uh, tried to upset the seniority system. But since that time, Speaker McCormick has been very faithful to him. In the Senate, after the word was received and Senator Edward Kennedy left the chamber, the Senate was quickly recessed pending further developments but reporters who were there report that many of the senators remained slumped in their seats on the floor and uh, just stunned. And Senator Richard Russell, Democrat of Georgia, said the whole nation was shocked by this dastardly crime. After a 15-minute recess, the Senate returned and had the Reverend Frederick Brown Harris, the Senate chaplain, say a prayer. And the Senate adjourned after the chaplain's prayer that Pre President Kennedy's life may still be spared. Now, at that time, uh, the President uh, had not expired. The members of the Senate had only the information that he had been shot and had been taken to a hospital. Now, of course, the reaction to such a dastardly thing is not confined to Washington or this country. Our reporters in Europe are filing in with reports of reaction overseas. First, we have this report from our European Bureau Chief, Rod McLeish, in London. In spasms of shock, then horror, then unsurpassed grief, Europe heard tonight of President Kennedy's shooting, last moments, and death. The mixture of emotions is too vast and volcanic here tonight to do more than simply note the ways in which it is expressed. Pope Paul hurrying to his private chapel to pray for the President in the last moments of his life. A Dutch diplomat saying, my God, how could it have happened? And a British diplomat saying, my God, what happens now? Today was French President Charles de Gaulle's 73rd birthday, and he, so full of life, was swift to express his grief and horror at the violent death of the young American president. Across the dark of Europe, a newscaster broke into the program of the U.S. Armed Forces Radio to tell American soldiers abroad of their president's passing, and he was heard to sob as he gave the news. Here in Britain, the BBC abruptly terminated all programs on its television network, and over the picture of a spinning globe played the dolorous chords of Brown's tragic overture. In Spain, General Franco was interrupted at a cabinet meeting with the news that Mr. Kennedy had been shot. The Spanish government prays for his quick recovery, said a spokesman, but by that time, Mr. Kennedy was dead. Rod McLeish, London. We just have a bulletin from the Associated Press that Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as President of the United States at about 1.38 p.m. Central Standard Time today. That would be 2.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The oath was administered by U.S. District Judge Sarah T. Hughes. Repeating that, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as President of the United States at about 1.38 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2.38 Eastern Standard Time. The oath was administered by U.S. District Judge Sarah T. Hughes. That means that Mr. Johnson was sworn in just 38 minutes after the death of President Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy passed away 
in the hospital in Dallas at exactly 1 o'clock. Continuing our reaction from overseas, we have this report from our Berlin correspondent, Ed DeFontaine. The assassination of President Kennedy has shaken Berlin and its population to its roots. West Berlin Mayor Willy Brandt was barely able to speak when notified of the President's death, and Evangelical Bishop of Berlin, Otto de Bellius, expressed his grief at hearing the news. Berliners on the street were unable to believe reporters when they were approached with the news that Mr. Kennedy, who visited this city in June, was dead at the hands of an assassin. The United States Commandant in Berlin, Major General James Polk, who immediately went to the emergency command center of his headquarters in Berlin on hearing the news, said that he was shocked beyond words. General Polk, like others who were contacted, appeared close to tears on hearing of the president's death. The radio and the television programs in West Berlin and West Germany are devoting their entire program to the news and to programs of somber music. Only in East Berlin were the programs unchanged, although communist news broadcasts carried the bulletin. West German Chancellor Ludwig Erhardt is on his way back to Bonn from France, and in his absence, Vice Chancellor Erich Mende sent the first telegram of condolence from West Germany to the United States. This is Ed DeFontaine reporting from Berlin. Repeating the information we gave you before hearing Mr. DeFontaine's report, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as president at 2.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this afternoon. The oath was administered by U.S. District Judge Sarah T. Hughes. Uh, Johnson took the oath aboard the presidential plane, and the plane was parked at the Dallas, Dallas Love Field. Now, from that information, I gather that Mr. Johnson is flying on the same plane with Mrs. Kennedy and the body of the president, which was placed in a casket at the hospital and carried out to the airport. As I said earlier, our Group W correspondent, Sid Davis, who was in Dallas covering the president's activities today, is one of three reporters assigned to fly to Washington on that plane. So Sid Davis was on hand as the new president boarded, boarded the plane to come back to Washington. Mr. Johnson becomes the 36th president of the United States and he is the eighth vice president to assume the, president, the presidency through the death of a president. Now the FBI, part of this story is what happens to the man who shot President Kennedy and wounded the governor of Texas today. As of this moment, he has not been apprehended, but you can be certain that one of the most intensive searches in the history of this country is being carried on at this moment to apprehend him. And you have details on that? Well, you can be sure, Jim, that the law enforcement agency of this government en masse are, derive, are taking every effort possible to find this assassin. Uh, Director J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI telephoned the Dallas FBI office and ordered them to conduct an all-out investigation of the, uh, the murder and the attempt on the lives of others in the presidential party. And can you give us some background on Mr. Johnson, who now, at the age of 55, becomes the 36th president of the United States? Well, the new president has something in common with the past, the late president. Johnson also served in the Navy, as President Kennedy did. He uh, volunteered for active duty in the Navy when he was a congressman, a few days after Pearl Harbor. He uh, was called back sometime later when uh, President Roosevelt called all congressmen back to Washington. And he now is a commander in the Naval Reserve. Uh, President Johnson got his political beginnings under the wing of the late Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, President Roosevelt took an interest in him when uh, Johnson was a congressional aide up here in Capitol Hill, and uh, he encouraged him to make a race for the Senate 
which uh, Johnson lost at that time later to win another race to the Senate. In general, uh, the new president's philosophy stems from his association with the New Deal and that era. He's uh, considered uh, fairly uh, liberal on, on certain points and uh, conservative on others. However, he is credited with shepherding through the Senate the, the first civil rights bill to be enacted by Congress in 80 years. That was the 1957 civil rights bill. But generally, he uh, would take a middle-of-the-road attitude on major issues. Well, Anne, in your experience in Washington, you knew Mr. Johnson when he was a comparatively young man in the early stages of his uh, Washington career. Didn't he start out as a school teacher before he even came to Washington? Yes, uh, he did teach school for a while. And incidentally, he you know, worked his way through college, doing all sorts of jobs like handing and sweeping out the corridors and such as that. And his first assignment in Washington was not as a member of Congress. Uh, he, yes, he first came here as a secretary to a congressman from Texas, but he did uh, take a job that President Roosevelt offered him as director of the National Youth Administration. And he served uh, several years in, in that job until he himself ran for Congress in 1937. Now, we all know that Mr. Johnson uh, did not feel that the vice presidency was the end of his political career and that he uh, considered himself a presidential possibility for 1968. I wonder, of course we can't know this, but uh, from what you know of his personality and his drive, um, once he gets over his original shock at what has happened today and being catapulted into the presidency, how do you think he would approach the job in the White House? I think he will approach it very seriously with all respect for the office and the responsibility that it carries with it. He will be a very good administrator. Lyndon Johnson is an excellent organizer. He believes in organization. He has a great deal of drive, as everyone knows. When he was majority leader of the Senate, he was regarded as uh, one of the smoothest operators insofar as arranging legislative schedules and legislative votes that the Senate had ever seen. In fact, uh, he has been criticized on that score. But he did conduct an orderly legislative schedule when he was in the Senate. Now, part of the reaction here in Washington today uh, includes bitterness. For example, Senator Clinton Anderson, Democrat of New Mexico, says the president probably should not have gone to Dallas. Anderson said, <clears throat> when they shoved Lyndon Johnson around in 19 1960, when they spat on Adelaide Stevenson, I suppose it indicated the temper of the place. The reference to Mr. Johnson being shoved around in 1960 is to a, an incident that occurred during the 1960 presidential campaign when Mr. Johnson was campaigning as the Democratic vice presidential candidate. I recall it was at a hotel in Dallas. And he and uh, his wife, Lady Bird, as she is known, arrived at this hotel and were heckled by a group of people, uh, Republicans, I assume. And uh, there was quite a bit of dismay here in Washington because a Republican, Texas Republican congressman, Bruce Alger, was in the group. And the group became very unruly, and uh, it was touch and go there for a while, whether or not Mr. Johnson and his wife would be able to get into the hotel without being bruised or knocked off their feet or something. However, Mr. Johnson stayed calm, if not uh, rather irate in such a situation, and it did not uh, become as dangerous as some people thought it might. One thing I might mention, Jim, is there had been many rumors in Washington in the last few years that President Kennedy was not paying enough attention to Lyndon Johnson and that he was trying to downgrade him. But these stories were generally not believed. Uh, the President gave Mr. Johnson many major important assignments uh, in the field of, of uh, equal opportunity and jobs and housing and made, made him uh, chairman of the Space Council. He sat in on cabinet meetings and was uh, called to the White House for practically every major decision that was made uh, in any situation of 
of a crisis nature such as the Cuban crisis. We have word of the doctor's report from Dallas, the official doctor's report on exactly what happened to Mr. Kennedy. According to the United Press, President Kennedy was shot through the throat and head, possibly by the same bullet the attending surgeon said today. Dr. Malcolm Perry, 34 years old, said, there was an entrance wound below his Adam's apple. There was another wound in the back of his head. Two of the 10 doctors in attendance on the president said it was possible that one bullet entered the throat and went through the back of the president's head. It was possible, they said, that he was hit by two bullets, but they doubted it. The president's throat <clears throat> was open to relieve breathing. Blood and fluids were administered intravenously. The doctors labored to keep respiration at a life-sustaining level. However, their labors were, of course, in vain, and they really didn't, they were working against time because the president was shot at 1230 Dallas time, and he died at one o'clock Dallas time. As we've said, <clears throat> there has been much reaction here in Washington. This is a very sad city indeed today. And I'd like to repeat one of the bits of reaction from a member of the United States Senate. This is a statement issued by Senator U. Scott, Republican of Pennsylvania. It reads, the whole nation shares the grief of the family of John F. Kennedy in the assassination of the president. John Kennedy served his country well and died in its service. Our hearts are heavy and our heads are bowed. Our love and sympathy encompass his bereaved family. We have lost a leader and a friend. The Republic still stands. The assassin killed a man, not the presidency. We must all rally around the new president of the United States in this time of national crisis and pray for the health, strength, and well-being of President Lyndon B. Johnson. We must give him our understanding and help. That statement from Senator Hugh Scott, Republican of Pennsylvania. Repeating, Lyndon Johnson became the 36th president of the United States at 2.38 Eastern Standard Time this afternoon when he was sworn in as president in Dallas. You might be interested in the oath that Mr. Johnson took as he was sworn in. The oath reads, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So that's the story on this very dark day in the history of the United States. President John F. Kennedy died of an assassin's bullet at 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this afternoon in Dallas, Texas. 38 minutes later, Lyndon Bain Johnson, age 55, was sworn in as the 36th president of the United States. This is Jim Snyder with Ann Corey in Washington. They only have room for two pullers, for three pullers, and me and Chuck Roberts are going to have to flip to see who goes. Yeah. But Mrs. Kennedy is going back with it. Uh, now, should I flip them or stay here? Uh, stay there. In Dallas. Right. All right, then I'll tell Roberts he goes. Just a minute, Sid. Once, Jim. Yeah, Sid, stay there. Jim, yeah. put this on the air. Do you have a line open? What do you got? The vice president will be sworn in just a few minutes. I believe it's going to take place right on the jet. Okay. Now, look, Sid, you, can you stand by there till I do an intro on the line? Uh, I don't have a hell of a lot of time. It'll have to be about a one-minute story. Okay, oh. hold on. Station, stand by. Jim Snyder will be coming up very, very quickly. Attention, Jim Snyder coming up very quickly. Give me a level, Sid. Give me a quick level. Hello, 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 hello. Give me a quick level. Okay, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. You've got 15 seconds to go, Sid. 15 right. seconds. Five seconds from... Do you hear that? Right. Okay, Sid. Go! 
This is Sid Davis reporting from the Dallas airport, where three hours ago the scene was gaiety as President and Mrs. Kennedy got off a glistening Air Force airplane to meet a crowd of well-wishers. Three hours later now, the scene is utter tragedy. Aboard the plane, in a bronze, solid bronze casket, is the President. And Mrs. Kennedy is aboard the plane, which will be departing for Washington very shortly with the President's body. White House staff people are also aboard, and we are told that the Vice President will be sworn in as President within a few minutes. This is Sid Davis with this information from the Dallas airport in Dallas, Texas. Okay. President John F. Kennedy is dead, and the people of Dallas are asking themselves why. It was a sniper's bullet that killed the president, while a crowd in the thousands welcomed him and his wife to town. But Dallas has a recent history of hostility toward members of the Kennedy administration. When Lyndon Johnson and his wife came campaigning in 1960, a rowdy group of Republicans roughed them up in a hotel lobby and held them in a corner. A few weeks ago, a woman demonstrator's placard struck Adlai Stevenson on the head, and another Stevenson critic spat in the ambassador's face. Today, as the presidential motorcade rode into town under a bright Texas sun and a blue sky, some might have recalled those incidents, but few here believe the tragedy that has come would happen. President Kennedy died of a bullet wound of the brain, said the terse announcement to reporters. Associate News Secretary Malcolm Kilduff couldn't hold back the tears when he announced, John F. Kennedy is dead. Fighting emotion, Kilduff, speaking from a hurriedly set up press room in Parkland Hospital, said, death came at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. One hour and 39 minutes later, the machinery of this government elevated Lyndon Johnson to the nation's highest office. It was a solemn, simple ceremony in the presidential compartment of Air Force One, the big plane that only three hours before had brought a smiling president and his wife to Dallas. Shocked beyond belief, Mrs. Kennedy, her left leg and stocking soaked with the blood of her husband, stood to the vice president's left. Mrs. Johnson was on his right as a U.S. District Judge, Sarah Hughes, appointed to the Texas Federal Courts by President Kennedy, administered the oath of office to the new president. The 67-year-old judge's eyes were wet. Johnson embraced both Mrs. Kennedy and his wife after the 30-second ceremony, then said solemnly, let's get this plane back to Washington. After I watched this sad meeting, the plane carrying Mrs. Kennedy, her husband's body, and President Johnson took off for Washington. The headline in tonight's Dallas Papers, Blair, President Kennedy is dead. As I walked toward the airport, a man said to me, this country is sick. Maybe this will shake it up. This is Sid Davis reporting from Dallas. 10 seconds from Mark. Five seconds. No one could ever have conceived that the plush and comfortable reception lounge aboard the presidential jet would be used to swear in a new president of the United States, or that the plane would ever be used to carry a president's body from such a nightmarish incident. To one who experienced the day's events in Dallas, they remained bewildering, but they did occur, and no one can change what took place. At 2.30 Dallas time, some 27 persons, including this reporter, were gathered in the lounge compartment. Vice President Johnson asked for a tall glass of ice water. A minute or so later, a tray with ice water was brought in for him. Only 90 minutes before, he and President Kennedy were in a motorcade heading for a luncheon appearance. Now the whole picture was changed. On the Vice President's left was Mrs. Johnson. At 2.35, Mrs. Kennedy, looking worn, entered the compartment. Everything became silent. Her bright raspberry-colored suit was bloodstained. Her left leg was covered with dried blood from the President's mortal wound. Mrs. Kennedy took her place to the vice president's left. Judge Sarah Hughes, quickly summoned from her district post in Dallas, administered the oath. She asked the vice president to raise his right hand. The vice president placed his left hand on a Bible that had been aboard the plane. In 30 seconds, the oath was finished. President Johnson turned, embraced Mrs. Kennedy, his wife, and Evelyn Lincoln, President Kennedy's secretary. Softly but sternly, out of concern for Mrs. Kennedy and the Kennedy family, he said, let's get this plane back to Washington. 
It was 2.39 p.m. Central Standard Time. At 2.45 p.m., the plane was off the runway and speeding to the Capitol. This is Sid Davis reporting from the White House. The body of President Kennedy will be brought to the White House sometime during the night. It is being prepared at the Bethesda Naval Hospital by a local Washington funeral director. The time of its arrival has not been announced, but an honor guard will line the northwest grounds of the White House when the casket is brought in for placement in the East Room. There, a special honor guard will maintain a 24-hour vigil. Mrs. Kennedy is spending the night at the Naval Hospital. She will return to the White House in the morning. The two Kennedy children, John Jr. and Caroline, apparently have not been told of their father's death. When they were taken from the White House earlier in the evening, the White House indicated then that they did not know about the tragedy. The latest word is that the situation is still the same. The presidential casket will lie in the East Room on a catafalque, a platform similar to the one used for President Lincoln. Four candles, two on either side, will remain lighted while the body rests in the White House, and two Roman Catholic priests will offer prayers during their all-night vigil over the president's remains. The Kennedy family has expressed the desire that no flowers be sent to the White House or the burial. Instead, they request that equal donations be made to charity. Outside the White House, Washington residents are paying silent respect. Long lines of people still peer through the iron gate on this chilly, unbelievable night. Their faces express bewilderment, curiosity, and sadness. This is Sid Davis reporting from the White House. Chicago's Mayor Richard Daley, a close personal friend of the late President Kennedy, went into seclusion tonight. Grieving over the loss of the President, the mayor was reported to have immediately burst into tears and retired to his home. He issued this statement, I cannot express my deep grief and sorrow over the tragic death of President John F. Kennedy. He was a great president, a great leader. The people of Chicago had many occasions to see and hear this great young American, and his vital spirit, sincerity, and warm personality have given us all a memory that we will cherish and never forget. As mayor of Chicago, speaking for the people of our city, I express my heartfelt condolences to his wife and family. Chicago's Mayor Richard Daley, on the death of his close personal and political friend, John F. Kennedy. Rod Lowe in Chicago. Grief-stricken Mrs. Kennedy has yet another tragic task to perform when she returns to the White House. She must tell her two children what happened to their father. John Jr., whom his father lovingly called John John, will be three years old on Monday. Caroline will be six on Wednesday. Gay birthday celebrations had been planned for them at the White House and at Cape Cod, where the Kennedy clan was to gather for their traditional family Thanksgiving next week. Both the children were at the White House in the care of their nurse when the president was assassinated in Dallas. Senator Edward Kennedy, the president's brother, their sister Eunice Shriver and her husband went to the White House shortly after they received the news. Sergeant Shriver remained with the children, but the others flew to Cape Cod to be with their parents, Mrs. Rose Kennedy and former Ambassador Joseph Kennedy, who suffered a stroke in December of 1961. The burden of grief on Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy at this moment is incredible. Only last August she lost her infant son, Patrick Bovier Kennedy, who died two days after he was born. At that time it was the president who took Caroline and John aside and told them of the family tragedy. Ann Carrick in Washington. It is now 10 minutes past four in the nation's capital. 14 hours and 10 minutes since the announcement was made that President John F. Kennedy was dead. That took place 1,400 tragic miles from here in Dallas, Texas. I'm standing in front of the White House, the front that faces Pennsylvania Avenue. It is called the North Portico. And I'm facing the North Portico where black mourning cloth has been draped over the entranceway. An honor guard is now marching down to the northwest gate, part of the semicircular driveway that leads up to the north portico and the entranceway. We are awaiting the arrival of the president's body. 
It is en route now from Bethesda Naval Hospital, about 13 miles from here in Maryland. En route with the body is the president's widow, Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. We understand the president's brother, the attorney general, Robert Kennedy, and some of the president's very close associates, Kenneth O'Donnell and Larry O'Brien, are also coming. Here on the White House grounds, it's a clear fall night. The temperature, 63 degrees. There's a slight November breeze and chill in the air. And out on Pennsylvania Avenue, people who have been standing there all night are now awaiting the arrival of the president's remains. There are, I would say, 100 to 200 people that I can see. Floodlights light the driveway. And 13 kerosene flares have been placed at about 50-foot intervals along the circular driveway leading up to the uh, entranceway in the north portico under the giant white columns. About 10 Marines with polished bayonets, part of the military district's ceremonial guard, stand ready to receive the funeral cortege when it arrives here. The president's body will lie in repose in the White House tomorrow uh, and will be viewed by the Kennedy family during the morning and then later and throughout the day by such people as President Eisenhower, the Supreme Court, members of Congress, and other dignitaries. On Sunday, it will be on public view in the Capitol Rotunda, and at uh, 10 o'clock Monday morning, it will be taken to a Catholic church here in Washington, for a requiem mass, the St. Matthias or St. Matthew's Cathedral on Rhode Island Avenue, where His Eminence Richard Cardinal Cushing, the Archbishop of Boston, will celebrate the mass. The White House grounds are dotted with television and radio technicians, broadcasters, pen and pencil reporters who have been on this long vigil throughout the day this unbelievable day, this bewildered day that has shocked not only this country, but the entire world. There are reporters here from many countries. Uh, nearby is uh, the TASS reporter reporting for the Soviet Union. And reporters of all uh, colors, nationalities. Uh, this is a very earth-shattering type of experience, something that many people believe could not happen in the 20th century. But indeed it has happened as witness the tragic developments of this day. Mrs. Kennedy has chosen in all of the moves that have been made transporting the president's body, has chosen to ride in the hearse with the casket. She did this from the hospital in Dallas when the body was taken from the hospital to the aircraft. She did this when the aircraft landed here in Washington and with the body was taken to the Bethesda Naval Hospital and she is again riding as close as she can with the uh, president. Not many hours ago Vice President Johnson became the president of the United States as a result of these circumstances and he is now at home with his wife and will be using the executive offices just across the way here in the old executive office building for the time being he will not be using the president's oval office here in the white house it's very hard uh, not to think of president kennedy when you look out over the beautiful trees and the grass here because the president was a man who loved the out of doors the other day, he had a ceremony in the Rose Garden. A group of uh, NEA secretaries, I believe, were here in town. And the president, uh, as is usual every day, greets certain visitors and groups to Washington. And they were out in the Rose Garden. And uh, their leader, or chairman, asked the president if he wouldn't talk a little about the history of the White House. Mr. Kennedy took time during his very busy day to explain that a certain tree was planted by Thomas Jefferson, and then another tree uh, was planted by Theodore Roosevelt, and so on. I think he knew who planted every single tree in front as well as uh, 
in the rear of the White House. As a matter of fact, the Rose Garden was one of his pet likes. It's no longer a Rose Garden. The other day when we were out there during this particular ceremony, we noticed the ground has all been dug up, and we were wondering whether tulips were going in. But that has been the president's pride and joy. It's just off his office. And uh, they say he's had a, a big hand in directing some of the plantings, the flower plantings that have gone in there. And it was a beautiful sight this past summer with various types of flowers that continued to bloom, brightly colored flowers. Uh, the reason we know that the Rose Garden was a very pet-like of his was that during a certain ceremony, I believe it was a ceremony honoring Winston Churchill, when Winston Churchill was made an honorary citizen just this past spring. Uh, it had rained very hard, and we were all standing in the grass, and the grass was newly planted. And the president suggested that perhaps we might want to move off the grass because... Uh, we weren't doing it any good, and we at first thought he was joking. We later found out that he wasn't, and uh, we got the word that we were to get off the grass because he wanted the little seedlings to be able to, or whatever little grass is called, he wanted them to be able to get a firm foundation. And uh, it is, uh, the grass there is very beautiful to present time. But there's a lot of history here at the White House. Mr. Kennedy spent uh, some three years here, three and a half years, and he has left his mark. I can look over to, as I face the north portico, I can look upstairs into the presidential apartment. This is the executive apartment where the president and Mrs. Kennedy, Kennedy and the children live. And the light burns in their apartment, although neither one is there. The children are at uh, the home, we believe, of relatives. And as yet, we have not been officially informed that they have been told that their father is dead. Uh, this information is very private at the present time, and the Kennedy family wishes that the uh, personal lives of the children would not be disturbed at this moment. We've also been requested uh, uh, that to use discretion in some of the photography that might be taking place, and uh, I believe anyone in similar circumstances would request the same courtesies. The uh, crowd in the street on Pennsylvania Avenue is looking northwestward. That will be the direction from which the uh, caravan will be coming. Ann Corrick of our Washington Bureau is uh, uh, standing over closer to the portico, and she is going to get back here with a description of uh, developments over there once this uh, caravan arrives. An honor guard of Marines, Army men, Navy men, Air Force men, and the Coast Guardsmen uh, line the stairway leading into the White House and through the lobby and to the left into the East Room where the President's casket will lie on a catafalque, a black catafalque. It is draped in mourning cloth. We were told that this catafalque or platform is similar to the one that was used by President Lincoln's family at the time of Lincoln's death. The East Room has a great deal of history attached to it, and that is where the President's body will lie and repose tomorrow for dignitaries and the family. And as we said on Sunday, he will lie in state at the Capitol Rotunda up until, I believe, it will be 9 o'clock p.m. for the public, and until then on Monday from 9 until 10 a.m., and then at 10 a.m. it will be the uh, procession will be uh, bringing the remains to the St. Matthew's Cathedral for a requiem mass. This will be a pontifical requiem mass at 12 noon. Washington is still very much shocked over what has happened today, as is the nation. It is very hard for one who experienced these developments today all the way from leaving yesterday with the president and Mrs. Kennedy and watching them as they smiled and met people in Texas and enjoyed themselves it seemed and then leaving the hotel in Fort Worth this morning uh, for Dallas which was only an eight minute flight very brief and the cheering welcome they received at the airport and the enthusiasm in downtown Dallas and then to find such 
cold tragedy facing uh, this first family uh, in just a split second when the president's life was snuffed out by a sniper's bullet. Uh, I think most of our dignitaries, former President Eisenhower, Mr. Hoover, and Mr. Truman, Hadley Stevenson here just a few hours ago at the White House, expressed in more eloquent terms how this country feels about its presidents and how the nation unites when something like this takes place. Washington, although it is a gay city, so far as diplomatic partying and the affairs of society go, is not uh, a what you might call busy city at night. Uh, Washington, although it's a big town, sort of rolls up the sidewalks at about 9 o'clock and things quiet down. But this evening, there's been a lot of traffic past the White House, people coming in from Maryland and, and nearby Virginia to take a look at this big mansion. I noticed uh, at the intersection of 17th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue to my left, which is just northwest of here now, the flashing lights of police cars are now stopping traffic and a procession is coming down Pennsylvania Avenue, the bright lights of the cars in a straight line and a flashing red light at the head car. There are no sirens that I can hear and I would doubt very much that sirens are going to be used. A police motorcycle officer is now coming down the street to the entranceway here at the northwest gate. The northwest gate, if, if you're familiar with the White House, is the gate to the right as you look at the White House. The large uh, uh, trees on these grounds are bare of leaves and lit up. Perhaps they look beautiful, perhaps they look grotesque under the lights that have been set up. This is a very historic but a very sad night. The procession now getting closer, a motorcycle policeman leading the first car with a red flashing light. There is, uh, I can't tell just how many cars there are, but the hearse, I believe it's a gray hearse, is the third car, third vehicle in the procession. Now the cars are coming into the driveway, into the iron gate. The people there are now st standing. They have paused for just a moment. Now the cars are, are moving in. Here comes the first car, which is a police car. The honor guard at the portico to my right now has snapped to attention. The Marines are now standing. Now they are marching. The Marines that went down to meet the procession are marching. Their rifles with their brilliantly shining bayonets, white gloves, dress uniforms. The rifles are at what you call port, port arms and they are leading the procession into the White House grounds. This is what you call a squad of Marines, part of the Washington Honor Guard. These same men have been the men who have joined in happier occasions here at the White House to welcome visiting dignitaries and chiefs of state. I'm going to try to see who I can see in the first car. The first car is the Armed Forces Police. Armed Forces Police, and I see General, I believe. I, I'm not familiar with the people in the first car. They seem to be some dignitaries and dressed in black, and I'm not familiar with <coughs> those gentlemen. But I do see some of the President's military aides now coming into the driveway in the second car. General McHugh, the Air Force aide, one of the President's close friends. And now the funeral coach, U.S. Navy. It's gray. The shades are drawn on uh, both sides. A flag is over the casket. I can see the flag through the rear of the funeral coach as it goes by. The United States flag over the casket. The blue field uh, toward the rear and at the left. The president's head apparently at the rear as the casket was moved in. Now the uh, hearse is at the north portico under the beautiful white marble columns and uh, I just now I've seen some of the close friends of the
Kennedy family, and Mrs. Kennedy has, I believe now, come out. This is a uh, very difficult spot, and we are not permitted to get entirely close. We are uh, about 50 yards from where the doorway, which is draped in black mourning cloth, and then we'll be taken through the lobby, then to the left into the east room. It was very hard to identify people in the cars as they came by. The blinds in the funeral coach were drawn. The uh, casket, so far as we can see from this position, is still in the funeral coach. Now uh, we are waiting. A Marine, a sailor, Coast Guardsman, and a soldier are standing to the rear of the hearse. This is a part of the ritual that takes place at the time of a president's passing. Earlier, two Roman Catholic uh, priests entered the White House. They are two priests who have been designated to sit with the president's uh, remains during the night. They will say prayers during the nights that the president's casket is here in Washington before burial. Now the casket has been removed from the hearse and the military contingent is carrying the flag-draped coffin into the White House. The gentleman leading the procession took his hat off as he went in. The casket has now gone through the doorway under the black mourning cloth that drapes the entranceway. And now a group of people following behind, and I could not at that moment see whether Mrs. Kennedy was there, but we will have that information in just a second as soon as Ann Corey gets back from her vantage point. Sixteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue. Is now written another page in history. John F. Kennedy fought very hard and worked very hard to become a resident of this big, beautiful house. And uh, no one perhaps dreamed that this incident would happen, yet it has. And Mrs. Kennedy, I believe, has received a great deal of sympathy as well as support for her behavior in these trying times. It was not many weeks ago that she lost a child. We do not have information on where the burial will take place. There is some talk, however, if it is not confirmed that the president will be buried next to the son that was lost this past summer in Boston, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. The honor guard is now filing in to the White House. And the people out in front of the White House are now beginning to file away. Going home, some of them are still there. However, I can, at another end, see that many of them are choosing to remain. Looking straight up the beautiful rolling green lawn here to the front door. Now I'm going to call in Ann Corrick get a report. Ann, we're going to get a report now on
on uh, what Ann has seen. Ann? It was a sorrowful scene to see the flag-draped coffin bearing the body of the late president being carried up the steps of the north portico and into the White House proper. Mrs. Kennedy in a pink coat followed him uh, and it appeared to be the president's brother uh, Bobby Kennedy, the attorney general, who followed her up the steps through the black draped entranceway and into the uh, where lobby. Were, where were the, uh, the uh, where was Bobby and uh, the Attorney General and Mrs. Kennedy? Could you have seen from there? It was very difficult to see. I know that was very hard. So you, it was. The honor guard no. was lined up. As you know, uh, we were restricted in a certain area, but back quite a distance from the portico itself. And uh, it was difficult to see with the pillars blocking the scene who, just exactly who, did get out of the limousines which arrived here. Uh, it is believed, it, it, it looked to me as if uh, uh, the, the president's sister, Jean, was one of those who uh, went into the White House with, after Mrs. Kennedy. Well, Ann, uh, it's getting very late into the morning. I think uh, we, can, we can say that this is probably one of the saddest sights Washington has ever seen. And I suppose uh, some should offer the hope that it never has to see another one like this. Uh, some of the staff people who are still in the press office, I noticed just went by Helen Gantz, who has been here for many years and served under several presidents. Mrs. Gantz has been here since 1949, served under three presidents. I noticed the tears in her eyes as she walked by me just a second ago, and uh, Nancy Olson and some people like that who have worked fairly close to the president who would see him perhaps every day. I'm very moved by this, uh, a very energetic man, and then suddenly to have such a tragic incident happen. There's very little more we can say in a manner of speaking perhaps John F. Kennedy has come home. Uh, I think one of the uh, things that might be appropriate at this time, he liked to quote from Robert Frost many times on the campaign, and uh, Fro Mr. Frost was one of his favorites. Mr. Frost died earlier this year, but one of the president's favorite quotations, and I believe it went something like this, I have promises to keep and many miles to go before I sleep. And with that, this is Sid Davis reporting from the White House. Back at the White House, of course, there is an atmosphere of gloom and great solemnity would like to check in there now. We switch you to Sid Davis at the White House. I think you can call it an empty feeling, but that's what one feels standing here, knowing that the body of President Kennedy is no longer in, in the house that he, while living, fought so hard to win. And I, uh, watching Mrs. Kennedy come out with the children, it's very hard for one to describe. It's almost a, an interference of one's personal life to try to describe the, the emotions of that family, particularly the children, little John on her right and Caroline on her left, dressed in uh, aqua, I believe you would call it aqua outfits, little coats, and they're Red Mary Janes, I think you could call the shoes the Red Mary Janes, little straps over them. And little John a bit impatient and bewildered and not understanding what this all means, uh, resting one foot behind the other, sort of putting his left toe behind his right heel while his mother held his hand until the casket was placed on the caisson. It's hard to ask yourself or what a child might feel when a uh, child is told that his father is dead. Caroline uh, 
has reached the age where she has some understanding of this loss. She will be six years old on Wednesday, and John Jr. will be three tomorrow. Two birthdays coming up this week. Uh, three years ago, I remember the, when Mr. Kennedy was the president-elect, and he had come home for Thanksgiving, come home to Washington, be with his wife because she could not travel at that time. She was about to have her baby. He had left Thanksgiving, I believe it was Thanksgiving afternoon, and was flying back to Palm Beach on a DC-6, a chartered flight. He flew back, as a matter of fact, on the press plane because the weather was not so good. There was a four-engine plane, and the Kennedy family plane was only two engines. And he got the news on Thanksgiving evening flying back to Palm Beach to continue the work for the new administration that he got the news by radio that his wife was in the hospital and had given birth and the pilot of that plane I, I know his name and I, I know him well his name is Bill Kramer he's with American Airlines brought the president up front into the cockpit of the airplane the president-elect at the time and the president talked to the doctors at Georgetown University Hospital and learn the condition of his wife and learn the condition of the baby and the plane raced back to Washington instead of going on to Florida and that was one of the happy occasions in this family's history but overall with many accomplishments they have not had what you might call the luck of the Irish Joseph P. Kennedy has lost two sons and a daughter to violent deaths and today's events are tragic as well to the whole nation. The president's office is now empty of all of his uh, filing cabinets and material. The only, the only furniture remaining is the large mahogany desk that Mrs. Kennedy had found in the basement here that was made uh, from some ship timber some 100 years ago. That remains in the Oval Office and the large circular red rug with a presidential seal embossed in its center uh, is all that remains. The office is empty, the pictures are down from the walls, uh, the rocking chair has been taken out, the president's little ship models and the gifts from other state heads of state have all been removed. The office is being prepared for President Johnson and at a time like this it seems almost barbaric, perhaps cruel to talk or to have to do these things but the government must go on and Mrs. Kennedy realizes this. The grounds of the White House have now almost cleared com completely. People have trickled away from the White House. Some still stand and watch. The sky is blue. The sun is shining. There's a breeze here. And the body of President Kennedy will come back once more tomorrow on its way to funeral services. This is Sid Davis speaking from the White House. The procession bearing the president's body has now reached the plaza of the Capitol building and the caisson, the procession has stopped, the caisson bearing the casket is stopped and there will be ceremonies here, the ruffles and flourishes, uh, a 21 gun salute and the playing of hail to the chief. One can't look at this scene without remembering that it was in this very plaza in January of 1961 that John F. Kennedy was inaugurated as the 35th President of the United States. It was a very cold day. It had snowed <clears throat> during the night. Here is Hail to the Chief.
the procession is at the plaza of the capital. You just heard the playing of Hail to the Chief, the song that is the traditional song of the President of the United States. As I was saying earlier, I was recalling the inauguration of John F. Kennedy in the, on this very spot in January of 1961. And you'll probably recall it was at that time that he made what is considered the most memorable statement of his administration when he said, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country will do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for this freedom of man. The eight military pallbearers are now bearing, or the military guard is, are bearing the president's casket up the steps into the Capitol. They are now mounting the steps of the Capitol building, moving slowly, one step at a time. The casket is draped in the American flag. casket has been carried to the top of the steps of the Capitol building. It is now approaching, walking across the little veranda of the Capitol, approaching the entrance, going in through the large brass doors. We're now going to switch you to our broadcast location inside the rotunda of the Capitol. We take you now to the Capitol Rotunda and Art Schreiber. Here in the Rotunda, there are hundreds of people stand silently, solemnly, as the clergyman just a few minutes ago arrived were the first to enter the Rotunda of the official cortege. Now the color guard has just walked in. Military men stand at attention as now the casket itself enters the Rotunda, being borne by the military guard. They carry it slowly. Behind is the presidential flag. They're in the center of the rotunda, walking now to the catafalque, which is cloaked in drape, black drape. They are now bearing the casket all the way around the circular rim, which has been roped off with the red velvet ropes and the guard is carrying the casket in a half circle around the, now they are uh, up on the catafalque and placing the casket which is draped with the american flag on the catafalque they stand there for a moment now they come to attention and move down 
four on each side, representatives of the five services of the armed services. And The Kennedy family has repeatedly requested that no flowers be sent in tribute to the late president, that donations to charity be made instead. But today here, there will be placed by this by the late president's casket, two wreaths, one of red and white carnations and small blue baby's breath with a card that says on it simply, the president. That wreath is from President Johnson. The other wreath is one of large white pom-poms. The card on it says simply, the House of Representatives. At the, uh, just to the west of the casket, at the, uh, within the circle of the rotunda, that now placed the American flag and the presidential flag, uh, this group now is standing silently, waiting for the family to enter into the rotunda. During these official ceremonies, Speaker, Mc Speaker McCormick, Senate Majority Leader Mansfield, and President Lyndon Johnson are expected to make a few remarks in tribute to their late leader. And now the military guard, which was part of the cortege, uh, has entered the rotunda and turned to the right and come towards us in the northwest quadrant they will take their place uh, down below to the west section. Uh, there was the company of the U.S. Navy enlisted men, uh, the Special Honor Guard, which was composed of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard, uh, the National Colors, and the clergy. Uh, it is now uh, completely filled here in the rotunda. It's very difficult for anyone to move uh, and Mrs. Kennedy uh, now has entered the rotunda and is standing at the east quadrant uh, right uh, inside the doorway as you enter the rotunda from the east entrance. She is flanked by military guards. It is silent the only noise that you hear in the rotunda is a quiet shuffling and the whir of movie cameras and the click and the flash of still cameras. The bearers of the casket are now moving away from the casket towards the east quadrant and the casket on the catafalque remains alone. Only the color guard stands to the west with the head of the beer. It is draped with the red, white, and blue of the American flag. Mrs. Kennedy has pulled back the veil from her forehead. She is dressed in black, the veil sweeping down the back of her head and to the sides. She just moved it away from her forehead.
with the surge of a light far from spent. And in a moment, it was no more. And so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands. There was a father with a little boy and a little girl and the joy of each in the other and in a moment it was no more and so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands there was a husband who asked much and gave much and out of the giving and the asking world with a woman what could not be broken in life and in a moment it was no more and so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands and kissed him and closed the lid of the coffin a piece of each of us died at that moment Yet in death, he gave of himself to us. He gave us of a good heart from which the laughter came. He gave us of a profound wit from which a great leadership emerged. He gave us of a kindness and a strength fused into the human courage to seek peace without fear. He gave us of his love that we, too, in turn, might give. He gave that we might give of ourselves, that we might give to one another until there would be no room, no room at all for the bigotry, the hatred, the prejudice, and the arrogance which confer converged in that moment of horror to strike him down. In leaving us these gifts, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, President of the United States, leaves with us. Will we take them, Mr. President? Will we have now the sense and the responsibility and the courage to take them. I pray to God that we shall, and under God we will. That was Senate Senator. Majority Leader Mike Mansfield, who has addressed uh, a now Chief Justice Earl Warren. the hearts of all of us as the passing of a president of the United States. There is nothing that adds shock to our sadness more than the assassination of our leader, chosen as he is to embody the ideals of our people, the faith we have in our institutions, and our belief in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Such misfortunes have befallen the nation on other occasions, but never more shockingly than two days ago. We are saddened. We are stunned. We are perplexed. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a great and good president, the friend of all people of goodwill, a believer in the dignity and equality of all human beings, a fighter for justice, an apostle of peace has been snatched from our midst by the bullet of an assassin. What moved some misguided wretch to do this horrible deed 
may never be known to us. But we do know that such acts are commonly stimulated by forces of hatred and malevolence such as today are eating their way into the bloodstream of American life. What a price we pay for this fanaticism. It has been said that the only thing we learn from history is that we do not learn. But surely we can learn if we have the will to do so. Surely there is a lesson to be learned from this tragic event. If we really love this country, if we truly love justice and mercy, if we fervently want to make this nation better for those who are to follow us, we can at least abjure the hatred that consumes people, the false accusations that divide us, and the bitterness that begets violence. Is it too much to hope that the martyrdom of our beloved president might even soften the hearts of those who would themselves recoil from assassination, but who do not shrink from spreading the venom which kindles thoughts of it in others. Our nation is bereaved. The whole world is poorer because of his loss. But we can all be better Americans because John Fitzgerald Kennedy has passed our way because he has been our chosen leader at a time in history when his character, his vision, and his quiet courage have enabled him to chart a course for us, a safe course for us, through the shoals of treacherous seas that encompass the world. And now that he is relieved of the almost superhuman burden we imposed on him, may he rest in peace. That was Chief Justice Earl Warren. The first speaker was Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield. And now House Speaker John McCormick. This is Jacqueline Kennedy and the other <coughs> bereaved members of our beloved president, former president Truman, Reverend Clergy, and my fellow Americans. As we gather here today, bowed in grief, the heartfelt sympathy of the members of the Congress and of our people are extended to Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy and to Ambassador and Mrs. Joseph P. Kennedy and their loved ones. Their deep grief is shared also shared by countless of millions of persons throughout the world, considered a personal tragedy, as if one had lost a loved member of his own immediate family. Any citizen of our beloved country who looks back over its history cannot fail to see that we have been blessed with God's favor beyond most other peoples. At each great crisis in our history, we have found a leader able to grasp the helm of state and guide the country through the troubles which beset it. In our earliest days, when our strength and wealth were so limited and our problems so great, Washington and Jefferson appeared to lead our people. Two generations later, when our country was torn in two by a fratricidal war, Abraham Lincoln appeared from the mass of the people as a leader able to reunite the nation. In more recent times, in the critical days of the Depression and the great war forced upon us by fascist aggression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and later Harry S. Truman appeared on the scene to reorganize the country and lead its revived citizens to victory. Finally, 
Only recently, when the Cold War was building up to the supreme crisis of a threatened nuclear war, capable of destroying everything and everybody that our pre prede predecessors had so carefully built and which a free, liberty-loving world wanted, once again, a strong and courageous man appeared ready to lead us. No country need despair so long as God in his infinite goodness continues to provide the nation with leaders able to guide it through the successive crises which seem to be the inevitable fate of any great nation. Surely no country ever faced more gigantic problems than ours in the last few years. And surely no country could have obtained a more able leader in a time of crisis. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy possessed all the qualities of greatness. He had deep faith, complete confidence, human sympathy, and broad vision which recognized the true values of freedom, equality, and brotherhood, which have always been the marks of the American political dream. He had the bravery and the sense of personal duty, which made him willing to face, face up to the great task of being president in these trying times. He had the warmth and the sense of humor, which made the burden of the task bearable for himself and for his associates, and which made all kinds of diverse peoples and races eager to be associated with him in his task. He had the tenacity and determination to carry each stage of his great work through to its successful conclusion. Now that our great leader has been taken from us in a cruel death, we are bound to feel shattered and helpless in the face of our loss. This is but natural, but as the first bitter pangs of our incredulous grief begins to pass, we must thank God that we were privileged, however briefly, to have had this great man for our president, for he has now taken his place among the great figures of world history. While this is an occasion of deep sorrow, it should be also one of dedication. We must have the determination to unite and carry on the spirit of John Fitzgerald Kennedy for a strengthened America and for a future world of peace. That was House Speaker John McCormick. The first speaker was Mike Mansfield, the Senate Majority Leader, and then Chief Justice Earl Warren of the Supreme Court and finally, Mr. John McCormick of Massachusetts, longtime friend of uh, the late President Kennedy. And Now, President Johnson slowly and solemnly walks to the beer, preceded by a member of the Honor Guard who is carrying his wreath, his personal wreath, to his former leader, he turns sorrowfully, solemnly, slowly, his head down, and walks away, back to his place. And now, Mrs. Kennedy, holding the hand of daughter Caroline, walks to the casket. She stands, now kneels. Her other child, son John, called John John by his father, became restless here in the rotunda during the speeches, and uh, he left with a member of the family. Now Mrs. Kennedy and Caroline take their place back to the, in front of the east entrance of the rotunda. Members of the official family, uh, of Pre former President Kennedy are 
standing uh, behind Mrs. Kennedy and Caroline, Attorney General Robert Kennedy was to her right facing the casket and behind them were the other members of the family, uh, the brothers and sisters of the Kennedys and uh, uh, m other members of the official family. And now they are leaving the rotunda, uh, Mrs. Kennedy, the Attorney General, followed by the other members of the family. President Johnson now leaves with his aides. At Mrs. Johnson, the President stops to shake hands with someone just before he left the rotunda. Here in the rotunda itself is silent. The clergy are waiting. They will be the last to leave. The guards still surround the casket as it's draped with the American flag. In front of it now is the wreath that Ann described to you, which says on the card, the President. Throughout this very heart-rending occasion, Mrs. Kennedy remained calm and composed. She stared sadly straight ahead at the casket which bears her late husband most of the time, occasionally glancing down to small Caroline at her side. Caroline in a little blue coat who will only be, six, only be six years old on Wednesday. Also, Mrs. Kennedy occasionally looked very graciously at Speaker McCormick and Senator Mansfield and Chief Justice Warren as they eulogized her late husband. It was while her husband was a member of the House and served here in this capital that Mrs. Kennedy met the late president. She was a newspaper woman at the time, and he always enjoyed news people. The members of the cabinet are leaving the rotunda now, slowly, their heads bowed. They had served less than three years with President Kennedy, most of them. And now they face a new administration. President Lyndon Johnson has asked them not to resign, but to remain at his side while he makes the great decisions ahead of him. Chief Justice Warren and members of the judiciary also leaving. And, and uh, Anne, as the official family and the dignitaries that you describe leave, uh, the rotunda. Uh, I'm sure the words of uh, Senator Mansfield will long remain when he said there was the sound of laughter and in a moment it was no more. And so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands. There was a wit in a man neither young nor old, but a wit full of an old man's wisdom and of a child's wisdom, and then in a moment it was no more and so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands. There was a man marked with the scars of his love of country, a body active with the surge of a life far, far from spent, and in a moment it was no more. And so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands. There was a father with a little boy and a little girl, and the joy of each and the other and in a moment it was no more. And so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands. So said Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield, one of the first of three speakers here in the ceremonies in the rotunda today. Now as the guards stand by the casket, people are filing from the rotunda. As John F. Kennedy, comes the sixth president of the United States to lie in state here in the rotunda of the Capitol. His coffin is resting on a catafalque first used nearly 99 years ago for President Lincoln, who was the first president to be assassinated. The catafalque was brought yesterday from a tomb beneath the crypt here at the Capitol and placed in the center of the rotunda. It's a simple beer which was fashioned from wood 
1865 for President Lincoln. Since then, it has served as a funeral couch for Presidents Garfield and McKinley, who also were assassinated, and for Presidents Harding and William Howard Taft. The catafalque was most recently used when the unknown soldiers of World War II and the Korean War rested there in May 1958. The dais stands two feet above the 11-inch base and is decorated with fringe swags and tassels. Here inside the rotunda, the casket of the president was placed upon the black draped catafalque. The four sentinels took their positions, two at the head, two at the foot of the bier. The family, the cabinet members, the Supreme Court justices, members of Congress, and the diplomatic corps and other government officials were present as the president's body was placed in state mourning. After the brief ceremonies were concluded, uh, the Capitol is now open to the public. Viewers will form four abreast and proceed up the east front steps to the rotunda. And there, the two single lines will be formed to pass by the flag-covered coffin. The public will leave the Capitol by the west door. Although the hours of viewing are scheduled to end at 9 tonight officially, uh, we have been told that no one in line will be turned away. The Kennedy family has asked that there be no flowers here in the rotunda. Any flowers that have been sent are being placed in the old Supreme Court chamber in the Senate wing. However, there is the official uh, flowers that Ann told you about from President Johnson. Aside from the draped stands for reporters, there is little here to detract from the casket and the catafalque which is centered now in the rotunda and capped 58 feet above by Ramides and Costagini's frieze. Four guards from the four services will stand as sentinels off the four points of the bier. They will stand guard here the entire time the president's body is in the rotunda. At 11 a.m. tomorrow, the president's body will be transported to St. Matthew's Cathedral, where a pontifical requiem mass will be celebrated at noon. And now, from the Capitol Rotunda. Speaking for Ann Corrick, this is Art Schreiber. And this is Jim Snyder. During the ceremony in the Rotunda, a light rain fell in Washington so that the streets are now wet. And Mrs. Kennedy emerged from the Capitol building, chatted very briefly with Mrs. Lyndon Johnson, then shook hands with President Johnson and with her two children, got into her limousine, and they have now proceeded down back down the route they came, traveling at a much more rapid rate than they traveled when they traveled to the Capitol. And Mrs. Kennedy is now about uh, to return to the White House. While this procession was going on, and before it, and during the eulogies that you heard by Senator Mike Mansfield, Chief Justice Earl Warren, and House Speaker John McCormick, in places all over the world, thousands, millions of people have also joined in the tribute to President Kennedy. In Europe today, churches were jammed as clergymen of all faiths praised and prayed for President Kennedy. On Tuesday, a special requiem mass will be held in St. Peter's Church in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. In Germany, Roman Catholic priests and Protestant ministers ask parishioners to pray for the soul of Mr. Kennedy and at U.S. military chapels in West Germany, special prayers were offered for the late president at all Sunday services. In Spain, the nation is in official mourning, and the newspapers there are still publishing special editions on the circumstances of the assassination. In Dungan'stown, County Wexford, Ireland, a place Mr. Kennedy visited this summer, there was a Requiem Mass said in the 137-year-old church where Mr. Kennedy's great-grandfather, Patrick, was baptized. And the parish priest gave a brief sermon and said, Never again will we see Jack Kennedy's smiling face, hear his voice, or shake his hand. Almighty God has called him to himself. In Germany, Chancellor Ludwig Erhard called an extraordinary cabinet meeting to honor Mr. Kennedy. In Singapore, more than a thousand people, including members of the diplomatic corps, packed a Methodist church to attend the memorial service for Mr. Kennedy. In Vatican City, Pope Paul VI told 30,000 people who gathered in St. Peter's Square 
that the assassination of Mr. Kennedy reveals, quote, how great a capacity for hate and evil there is still in the world and how great a threat to civil order and peace. In Warsaw, Nobel Prize winning uh, author John Steinbeck was meeting with a group of journalists and he described, <coughs> he talked to them of Mr. Kennedy and said he spearheaded all the liberal passions during his time in the White House. I dare to say, Steinbach said, there was no citizen he did not care about. At this point, perhaps it's inappropriate, but we have received the news that Lee Harvey Oswald, the man suspected of shooting Mr. Kennedy on Friday, died this afternoon in the same hospital in Dallas where Mr. Kennedy passed away at one o'clock Friday afternoon. Mr. Oswald was shot by a nightclub owner in Dallas, Jack Ruby, who rushed into the basement of the city hall and fired point blank at Oswald as the police were transferring Oswald from the city jail to the county jail in Dallas. Perhaps there is some justice, perhaps not, in the fact that at the time when the nation was paying tribute to Mr. Kennedy in this very solemn and sad ceremony involving the transfer of his casket from the White House to the Capitol, that th this event took place in Dallas and Mr. Oswald expired. We have been bringing you a special broadcast to the procession bearing the body of John F. Kennedy from the White House to the rotunda of the Capitol. Your reporters have been Sid Davis, Frank George, Dave Parker, Art Schreiber, and Ann Corrick. Our production supervisor was Charles Brailer. This is Jim Snyder in Washington.